Brother Wasim from New York emails and says that uh, how do we understand the hadith uh, in which some people are commanded to drink the urine of a camel for medicine? So how do we understand this hadith that drinking something that many of us would find najis or not something palatable uh, to use it as a medicine? وما أرسلنا من قبلك إلا رجالا إلا رجالا نوحي إليهم فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون. And in fact, the question is broader than this. He says that uh, his non Muslim colleague brought this up and he denied it. He said, There's no such hadith. So the non Muslim colleague told him it's in Sahih Bukhari. And he looked it up himself to make sure that it is there. And now he is confused what to do. Uh, so before I get to this issue of the, the prescription and the medicine and whatnot, subhanAllah, this story that happened with our brother, it illustrates that number one, we need to be very careful about speaking about the sharia without knowledge. If somebody comes and you haven't heard of it, don't just say, this is not Islam. Find out. He negated something. He said, no, this is not true. And the non-Muslim colleague knows more than him in this issue. said, it's in your book, Sahih Bukhari. And he did not know it is there. So these days, like subhanAllah, Allah tells us, by the way, in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ إِنَّ السَّمْعَ وَالْبَصَرُ فُؤَادَ كُلُّ أُولَاكَ كَانْ عَنْهُ مَسْؤُولَ Allah tells us, be careful, don't speak that which you do not have knowledge. Don't say with your tongue, this is halal, this is haram. Lying against Allah. Don't just invent it off the top of your head. Speak with knowledge. Or else, if you don't know, say, you know, I haven't heard of this hadith. Let me find out for you. Simple. End of story. If somebody comes with something new or exotic that you don't know, say, I'll find out and then come back to him. Right? So this person, unfortunately, Ani, our brother, he dug a hole for himself. Then the other colleague of his said, look, it's in your own book. Secondly, another thing we need to realize, the world is now a very, very different place than it, what it used to be. And many non-Muslims who don't like our faith are more aware of these quote-unquote problematic issues than many of us are. And this is why my philosophy is, if you haven't listened to my lectures, you know this, but I will tell you explicitly. My philosophy is, what is my philosophy? Say it like it is. Tell it like it is. Don't sugarcoat. Do not pretend something else. Actually, this should be our philosophy anyway. But unfortunately, sometimes people want to just hide or cover up. We don't have that luxury anymore. If you listen to my seerah, if you listen to other lectures, I am very blunt. And you will hear things from my talks that you will typically not hear from others because of this reason. I would rather you hear these things from me and I explain them to you. Then a non-Muslim colleague comes and then you have no idea what to respond and you get confused. And maybe you will get confused. What I'm seeing, the next generation, they start doubting their iman. This is what we are seeing. Maybe at this generation we don't understand and then we get it. But the next generation, if you don't explain to them beforehand, if you don't prepare them, all of these things add up together and they end up getting doubts or even worse than this. So this is leading us to the broader topic. And by the way, I also have to point out here, you understand I get over 100 questions a week. I choose the questions that are the most beneficial to everybody. So those that are emailing may apologize. I don't have a personal secretary. I cannot answer all of them. Out of all the questions that come, I choose these ones that are more useful for the Muslims of our time. So this is a question I thought was very useful because it involves many issues that some people might have questions about. Prophetic medicine and the prescriptions given. Some of which in our times, let's just say raise an eyebrow. This is one of them, right? So the answer I'm going to give isn't just about camel urine. It is the broader issue of that which is found in our traditions, in the classical traditions, in the hadith, that is of a medicinal nature. And what is our attitude towards that genre of 
uh, literature. So with regards to this issue of, I begin with the camel urine because that's what the question came about. It is true, it is authentic, it is mentioned in many books of hadith, including Bukhari and Muslim, that a group of people came from a faraway tribe and they pretended to convert. They thought they were, people thought they were Muslims, they pretended to convert and they demanded hospitality. And when you're a new convert, new Muslim, you're gonna be given hospitality. And they said that they had fallen sick and they mentioned a disease. We do not know the exact disease. It's probably some type of, of liver infection, some type of issue that we are trying. I mean, obviously the words used are not correlated to modern science, but some type of issue of maybe liver infection, spots come on the skin, the stomach becomes bloated, other symptoms of this nature. So the Prophet ﷺ said to them, to go to a particular garden of the Ansar and to drink the urine of camels and also to feed off the camels and take the milk of the camels. That was something that was known to cure this issue. Okay, so he sent them to this place and he said, drink the camel of urines. Now the urine camels and now these people, they flipped, they left Islam, they murdered the shepherd brutally, they stole the camels and they fled. So they became murtad, they stole the camels, they fled, and the uh, Sahaba, the Ansar, then captured them. This was an early Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ severely, severely punished them. So much so, later scholars differ. Is it allowed to do that type of stuff or not? That's a whole separate issue altogether. Has that been abrogated by the Hudud? Because the Hudud came after this incident. The punishment was very severe. You can read about it in the books. And then, because they also tortured the guy. So it's a, a tit for tat. So is it allowed to do? That's another controversy which we're not going to talk about today. Now, the issue comes how... Why and how is the command being given to drink the urine of camels? First issue to understand. The issue of najasa and tahara, of urine, of an animal, is classical issue of controversy. And the Hanbalis and Malikis consider the urine and even the defecation of animals that you eat to be tahir, not najis, in the first place. So two madhabs even say, look, the hadith doesn't raise any fiqhi problems anyway. It is tahir, it is not najis. And they have their classical evidences. Obviously the Shafi'is and the Hanafi say no, urine and defecation is always najis in every single animal. And that's their fiqhi uh, position. And the Shafi'is and Hanafis, they had to interpret this hadith in other ways. They said this is an exception. They said this is a one-off. They said this is a medicine that Barura allows to take, so they had their ways out of it. They would not allow anyone to take it anywhere from a fiqhi perspective. But the other two madhabs would allow it. And that is why to this day, uh, people who live in that region who are following the Hanbali madhab, it is well known, they still do this uh, practice and they uh, consider it to be uh, useful. Now, that's a fiqhi issue about the tahara and najasa. I want to talk about the broader issue. I want to segue into the issue of what is called tibbun nabawi, or the prophetic medicine. What do we do about this genre of a hadith regarding cures and medicinal practices, some of which are very obvious, some of which, as we said, might raise eyebrows. Now, if we look at the last 14 centuries of our tradition, it is clear that the vast majority of ulama and especially muhaddithin, scholars of hadith, they considered these traditions to be legislative, shar'i, from Allah Azza wa Jal intended to cure and guide us. And that is why almost every book of hadith has a section called Kitab al-Tib. Imam al-Bukhari has a book called Kitab al-Tib in his Sahih. Kitab al-Tib, the book of medicine. And Muslim has a section. And Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi. And many classical scholars even wrote special treatises, a special book. So Imam al-Asfahani died 430. He wrote Kitab al-Tib. Dhiya ad din al-Maqdisi died 646. Al-Dhahabi 748. The most famous book ever written is Ibn al-Qayyim. Volume. He has Kitab al-Tib, 751 Hijra. He has a book, Kitab al-Tib. Uh, Al-Suyuti has also a book on Kitab al-Tib. And many, many uh, books have been written. Some have been translated into English as well. And obviously, the understanding of this ulama is very clear. And that is that our Prophet is sent by Allah Azza wa Jal. Everything he is saying is legislative. He is telling us these medicinal cures. Therefore, they should be followed. And therefore, if you have this disease, you should drink camel urine. Okay, if you have this issue of the liver, whatever it is, you should also drink camel urine. And 
Ibn al-Qayyim says in his book, Kitab uh, At-Tibb al-Nabawi, he has a book called Tibb al-Nabawi, The Prophetic Medicine, which has been translated into English, Ibn al-Qayyim's. He has in this book, the, the, the medicine of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, listen to these adjectives, mutayaqqinun qat'iyun ilahi. It is certain, it is without any doubt, and it is divine. Mutayaqqin, yaqeen, qat'i, and ilahi. And it is coming from wahi, from Allah. And it is coming from mishkat al nubuwa from the well of prophethood. And this is the vast majority opinion. That's what it is. Alhamdulillah. You should be aware that there has always been a dissenting voice as well. You should be aware that there have been ulama from the past that have made an exception in this case. And there is a slightly different paradigm as well. And there are some great ulama who understood this genre in a different light. Amongst them is one of the greatest scholars of Andalus, Al-Qadi Iyad, who died 554 Hijrah. And he was from Andalus, from actually uh, uh, Qurtuba. And he wrote perhaps the most powerful book in love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is entitled, Al-Shifa Fi Hukuq Al-Mustafa. Right? It is a Mubarak book. Everybody loves this book. And nobody can accuse him, a'udhu billah, of not loving the Prophet His book proves beginning to end. And of the people as well who disagreed with this interpretation is uh, the famous uh, Qadi Abdul Jabbar, whom if you know who he is, then you know who he is. And also Ibn Khaldun, the author of one of the greatest history books, and also they say the father of modern sociology, which is actually quite true, to be honest. And the author of Muqaddimah, Muqaddimah Ibn Khaldun. And also... Perhaps the greatest scholar that India has ever produced. Who is he, O oh, people of India? Very good. MashaAllah. See, as I say it, all of you say his name. And this is so much barakah. Shah Waliullah Ad Dehlavi died 1762. He wrote over 40 treatises in Arabic and in Farsi. Did he write in Urdu, O oh, people of India? Did he write in Urdu, O oh, people of India? No, he didn't. Shah Waliullah did not write in Urdu. Because why? It wasn't a lingua franca at the time. Anyway, you guys should know your own history, guys. Anyway, so Shawali wrote the book Hujjatullah al Baligha, one of the most powerful books written. Uh, and, and by the way, subhanAllah, Shawali Allah, what an amazing character, subhanAllah. All of the strands of Indian Islam look up to him. All of them. They consider him to be mujaddid. Different, contradictory, mutually exclusive groups. They hate each other, they love Shawali Allah. Isn't that amazing, right? The Balilwi Deobandi Ahli Hadith. Very quickly, I'll say it. All of these groups, they don't get along with each other. They can't pray behind one another. But all of them consider Shah Waliullah to be their source and origin. Isn't that amazing? One of the reasons, by the way, Shah Waliullah thought outside the box. He wasn't your standard cut and paste, which is very common, but he was the person who's critically thinking. And I keep on saying this because not every critical thinker is negative. There's people that are changing for the better people that are shaking you to your core so that you think and this is what some of these people like Shah Waliullah like I was Ibn Taymi and others they are doing nonetheless Shah Waliullah was a strong advocate of this as well this other position which I'm going to talk about and that is that Tibb al-Nabawi is not something that is legislative in weight it's not something that we are commanded to follow Islamically this is a different paradigm and in our times one of the most exhaustive people to write about this is someone whom I consider to be a teacher even though I never met him uh, but I studied from his books and he had a profound impact on me when I was a teenager and his name is known to many of the Arabs in this audience uh, Dr. Umar Suleiman Al-Ashqar Dr. Umar Suleiman Al-Ashqar uh, is a person who graduated from the very first batch at the University of Medina 1962 when it was founded he studied with Sheikh Bin Baz Sheikh Albani Sheikh Shanqiti uh, he went on to do his PhD in Usul Al-Fiqh uh, in the topic of the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Af'al al-Nabi it is one of the most thorough dissertations on this topic and in this dissertation he discusses Tibb al-Nabawi are these actions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are these commands legislative or not 
And he has passed away, Allah Rahamu. I did not have the honor of meeting him, but he had a profound impact on me as a teenager. I read all of his books that I could get a hand of, especially his silsila that you all, those who know know. He has a book of uh, a series on, on aqid and whatnot. And he wrote uh, an article before he passed away, very recently, and he, I think 10 years ago or something. He wrote an article, very good article in Arabic. I strongly encourage you to read it. It's not in English. It is called Tibb al-Nabawi, Between Reality and Whatnot. So it's an article about Tibb al-Nabawi. And remember, this is a person whose teachers are Bin Baz and Shanqiti and Albani and all of these people. He is a figure and icon of the modern movement that uh, you are well aware of. And a great alim and allama and a specialist in usul al-fiqh. Specialist in usul al-fiqh. And he has an entire article about Tibb al-Nabawi. And much of what I'm going to say is from that article and from other sources as well. Uh, but anyway, so let us quote some of these people. Al-Qadi Iyad, in his book Al-Shifa, he says, These issues of the dunya, these issues of the world that the Prophet is, is uh, speaking about, it is possible that what the Prophet ﷺ says is not coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's coming from human experience. And therefore, it is possible that based on this human experience, something could be correct and something could be other than that. And this does not contradict the maqam al nubuwa because he was not sent to teach those human sciences. This is Qadi Iyad. Ibn Khaldun says, At-tib, the medicine that is found in the prophetic literature, it is not from the wahi at all. Rather, it is something that the Arabs would do. And this was the status quo when the Prophet ﷺ came. And this is not something that the Sharia is coming with. And our Prophet ﷺ was, came to teach us the Sharia. He did not come to teach us tib, nor to teach us any of the worldly sciences. And Ibn al-Khadun says, the example of this is the issue of the pollination of the, uh, of the nakhil, of the date palms. We'll talk about this uh, example. And he goes, and therefore all of these traditions of tib, of medicine, should be understood in light of the tradition of pollination of the dates. We'll talk about the pollination of the dates in a while. Shahawaliullah in Hujatullah al Baligha. He says, Ulum bin Nabi Sasam ala qismain. The knowledge of the Prophet is two categories, two types. The first of them is that which is coming from Tablighah al Risala. Allah Azza wa Jal is telling him to tell us. And the second of them is not coming from Allah Azza wa Jal, it's coming from his own time and place. And in this second category, this is Shawaliullah speaking, in this second category is what our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Innama ana bashar, I am a human being. And you know your dunya better than I do. So when I command you something of this deen, take it. And when I command you something of the dunya, فَأَنْتُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِأُمُورِ دُنْيَاكُمْ You know your dunya better than I do. This is Shah Waliullah from his, which book? Hujjatu Allah al-Baligha. And he says, and from this is all of the medicine. Minhu al-tib. This category is al-tib. In his PhD, Dr. Umar Sulaiman al-Ashqar, he goes into a lot of detail with regards to uh, 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 the evidences, the evidences of why this genre is not something that is legislative from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this is something that is coming from the culture and the people of the time and it is not binding on later generations to uh, follow. And of course, the most explicit, and this is where we begin with of these evidences, and by the way, only one question today, it's a very long question. Uh, the most explicit evidence is the incident in Bukhari and Muslim of the cross-pollination of the date palm trees, okay? It's a very, very powerful, interesting hadith. What is the story? The story goes as follows. So we should all know our basic biology and anatomy. I'm not a very good biologist, but uh, there is a male part of the date palm and there's a female part. Don't ask me to identify, but I know there is. Okay. And like with all pollinations, if you cross-pollinate and help, it will help produce the fruits and the, and the, and the crops for the next year. Okay, so the Ansar of Medina would physically themselves cross-pollinate. 
Okay, and by the way, farmers to this day, they have mechanisms to pollinate to their own crops. It helps, right? So the ansar would do the pollination from the male to the female directly on their own. They would physically do that. And the Prophet passed by one day and he said, why don't you leave this? Why are you doing it? Let it be natural. Why are you doing this? They, he advised them, he suggested to them to not pollinate. So that year, none of them physically and manually did the pollination. What was going to happen? The crops didn't come. So they came back to the Prophet and there were no crops. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, like you said, we didn't do it. And we don't have any crops. And so the Prophet sallallahu said, Innama ana bashar. I'm a human being. So when I command you something of your deen, follow it. And when I command you something of your dunya, then antum a'lamu bi dunyakum. Okay, this hadith is where? Bukhari and Muslim. It is very explicit, very authentic. Of the evidences as well, is the incident of the Battle of Badr, where the Prophet ﷺ camped at the Battle of Badr. And Ibn Ishaq mentions that Al-Hubab ibn al-Mundir came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Ya Rasulullah, ara'ayta hadha al-manzil? This place that you camped, a manzilun anzalakahu Allah, did Allah tell you to camp here? Or is it harb wa makida? Is it tactics of war? Now, by the way, and this is a very profound point. Hubab, a sahabi, look at the question he's asking. In his mind, there's two categories of actions coming from the Prophet ﷺ. He doesn't have any problem with that. In his mind, he can categorize the actions very clearly, but he doesn't know which one it is. Ya Rasulullah, is this place that you're camping Allah's command or is it a tactic of war that you think is best? And the Prophet said, it's a tactic of war. Hubab said, Ethan, in that case, I suggest you proceed onwards until the well is behind us and we are between them and the water. They will not. And so he went on and he told them and that's exactly what the Prophet did. That's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ did. Now what does this show? The Prophet ﷺ, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ And he's camping that he thought is a good location, but Hubab is the one who has the arts of war mastered more. That's what he has done his life. So he tells, no, go over there. And of the evidences as well that uh, Dr. Ashkar brings is the hadith also in Sahih Bukhari. Listen to this hadith. It's a very simple and interesting, yet it's obvious. Umm Salama says that the Prophet ﷺ said, Innama ana bashar. Notice the same phrase. He keeps on reminding people, I'm a human being. I'm a human being. I'm a human being. Innama ana bashar. I am a human being. And you take me as a judge when you come to me. And sometimes one of you might be better at arguing the case than the other. So I'm convinced by the argument and I side with the better arguer. So let that person know that if the haq is not on his side and I side with him, then my verdict is essentially giving him, cutting him a piece of jahannam. Meaning what? An invalid argument is not going to make the haram halal or the haq batil. You get the point here. If you have a good lawyer, right, gets you off on a technicality, you are not off in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what, what, what is the evidence over here? Where is the evidence? The Prophet ﷺ is saying, maybe one of you will convince me because of what? Hmm? Good arguments. And he begins by saying, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ I don't know ilm al ghaib I don't know who is the one. You are coming to me, both of you. Perhaps one of you has a better tongue than the other. And so I'm persuaded by him. And so I say, oh, this belongs to him. But it doesn't. And you know it doesn't belong to you. So he is saying, even if I say it, Allah will not forgive you. This is what he's saying. That's that. But the point is, he begins with your argument so you understand the humanity of the mention over here. As well, and of course, this is applied very clearly also in Sahih Bukhari. When the husband and wife, 
accused, yani the mula'ana took place that the husband accused his wife of zina, the famous case that took place over there because of which Allah revealed in the Quran the verses of li'an and the woman became pregnant and the man said, this is not my child, right? The famous incident that happened in the seerah. And uh, the, 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 the two of them did the four, the four la'natullahi ala al-zalimin la'natullahi ala kathibin and then the fifth one, they, they did, they, they, sorry, the four of them was, I am telling the truth. And then the fifth one is, whoever is lying, Allah's la'na is going to be on them. And they both did it. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah knows one of you two is lying. You both can't be correct. And it was, the context is very clear that she is lying. What did our Prophet ﷺ say? If I could have executed the head on anyone without evidence, it would be this lady. But did he? Like it's almost certain, but hey, I have to judge by outer. So that is also uh, applied over there. And the source of knowledge of medicine is actually very explicit. It's in the hadith in Muslim Imam Ahmed that Urwa ibn al-Zubayr used to say to Aisha, or once he said to Aisha, remember Urwa ibn al-Zubayr is Aisha's what? Nephew, right? Urwa ibn al-Zubayr is Aisha's nephew. Because <laughs> Asma's son. Right, so Khala's son. So he would say to Aisha, Ya Ummah, dear mother, I am not surprised that you're so intelligent because you are the wife of the Prophet and the daughter of Abu Bakr. And I'm not surprised that you're knowledgeable of poetry and of history because of your father. But I am surprised where did you get your knowledge of medicine from? This is Urwa asking his aunt. Look, I, I, you're smart. You know many things, history. Where did you learn medicine? I'm surprised. This hadith is in Muslim Imam Ahmed. Aisha said, O oh, Urwa, people would come from the Arabs, delegations from all over Arabia to the Prophet ﷺ. They would come from every area. And I would ask them about the herbs, about the herbal medicine. And I would then prescribe to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam what I learned. So Aisha is a smart lady, obviously, radiallahu anha. She's precocious, she's learning. But what's the source of her knowledge? The tajriba of the Arabs. She's asking all the ladies coming from all over Arabia. And this is, of course, herbal medicine, which is, of course, fine. But in the end of the day, where is it coming from? The people's experience. It is coming from people's experience. And another evidence which is very explicit as well, and this is actually one of the most explicit. Pay attention to this one. It's very clear. Hadith is in Bukhari as well. The Prophet wasallam said, I was about to forbid you to do ghayla or ghila. What is ghayla or ghila? It is to engage with intercourse in your, with your wife while your wife is breastfeeding. So during that one year, right, to impregnate or even to engage in intercourse. This is a term in Arabic called ghayla. And there was a legend or rumor that if you do this, the milk will spoil. The milk that is being fed to the child will spoil. And so it should not be done. So the Prophet ﷺ said, I was about to forbid you from intimacy with your wives for this entire period when they're breastfeeding. But then I observed the Romans and Persians and that they don't have this. They practice intercourse during this time frame and it does not harm the child. So therefore, go ahead. Now, this is as explicit as you can get. This is in Bukhari and Muslim, right? Where is the source of tajriba coming from? The people. The people around, right? And Allah Azza wa Jal delegated to our Prophet that authority that he has the right to make sharia. And if he had said it, it would have become sharia. Alhamdulillah, he didn't. But if he had said it, haram and halal. It becomes sharia because that would have been religion then. But what is the source of this medicinal knowledge? He is observing in this regard. And the point is that the Prophet 
did many things because of the time and place that he lived in, based on the knowledge available to him. For example, his military tactics, the equipment that he used. For example, the script of the Arabic, even though he didn't write it, but he dictated the Quran, the Quran's being written. Somebody could argue that script should be binding because that's how the Prophet made iqrar of the script. Nobody does that anymore. If you try to read that script, you will not be able to read it. How did he run the government? He did not have departments. He did not have dawaween. It is well known who was the first person to make dawaween. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. The first person to make ministry of war, ministry of zakah. He didn't have ministries of Prophet He didn't run the government that way. Umar ibn al-Khattab came and changed it all. Then the Umayyads came, by the way. And the Umayyads took the Roman system completely. Hook, line, and sinker. And they... Uh, adopted it and then Abdul Malik ibn Marwan came and he Arabicized it for around 80 years the people who ran the government the bureaucrats were Roman Christians they were Latin the Muslim ummah was run in Latin for around 80 years by the way because the Muslims were more open minded than many are but that's a different world altogether anyway so point is that Abdul Malik ibn Marwan came the first time and he Arabicized the Dawawin that's not my talk today why am I going there uh the Prophet ﷺ did not have departments. He did not have dawaween. Later, Sahaba understood. So what? He did it, we did it a different way. The point is, those ulama, Al Qadi Iyad, Ibn Khaldun, uh, Dr. Muslim, they're saying, Tibb al Nabawi is the same genre as how to run a government, the script of the Arabic language, the things that, the architecture of the time. It's not something that is legislative and binding upon later generations. Now, Dr. Ashkar makes an exception, which I agree with. He said, only if the Prophet explicitly links it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then yes, it becomes sharia. For example, honey. It's in the Quran. It is Allah azza wa jal making it shifa. If it's mentioned that there's shifa from divine, then that's a separate issue altogether. Otherwise, these other prescriptions that are found, and it's not just the hadith of urine, but that's the, probably the most shocking to our sensibilities, but there's a lot of these, maybe like two dozen of them. These things are not things that need to be necessarily followed. That's the, the argument of the other group. Now, by the way, we are not talking about spiritual remedies. Spiritual remedies are obviously from the Quran and Sunnah. For example, ruqya. That's something spiritual that's not physical. What's another example of a spiritual remedy you can give me? Spiritual remedy. That would be physical, according to the other group. Spiritual remedy. Right? Treat your sick by giving sadaqah. Giving sadaqah, is this a physical cure? No. This is spiritual. We're not talking about that. Of course, that's something from the sharia. Right? So we're not talking about the spiritual cures. We're talking about the physical cures if they are not linked with Allah Azza wa directly. If Allah is not telling us that this is from the sharia or something, then it is not something that is necessarily binding. And this is the other opinion. Now, I want to also point out here that this obviously, obviously is a problematic uh, emotional area because some people might feel that the status of nubuwa is being impinged. And that's why Al-Qadi Iyad himself said, this doesn't harm maqam al nubuwa And Ibn Khaldun says the same, because even when they're writing it, they're worried, what will the people think about this issue? Are they going to then? And here we get to this interesting point. Again, if you listen to my seerah, I mentioned this many times. The farther you go from the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the easier it is to make it slightly more bigger or exaggerated than it actually was. The closer you get to his time frame, the Sahaba, for example, didn't have any problem asking him point blank, Ya Rasulullah, is this from you or from Allah? I mean, look at that frankness. Will anybody say the Sahaba didn't respect the Prophet ﷺ? Their respect was based upon knowledge. Frankly, much of our respect is based upon emotion, not knowledge. Right? And so let me give you a simple example we all understand. Do you think any Sahabi ever claimed that the Prophet ﷺ knows ilm al-ghayb? No. Do you think any tabi'i, taba tabi'i ever claimed that the Prophet ﷺ is made out of nuri ilahi? 
Do you think any scholar in the first 300 years ever said that the Prophet is Hazir Nazir? The Arabs don't know what I'm talking about, but this is a group these others know about, okay? Now, when did these notions come in the Ummah? Much later. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Nobody who interacted with the Prophet could ever say he knows Ilm al Ghaib. This can only come 500, 1000 years later. When the generations have gone so far that the image you have of the person is no longer the person himself. Then you can have groups, entire firqas, whose entire aqidah is based upon a persona who never actually existed. He's not even human. He never has a shadow. He didn't eat and drink. He floated on the air. He never used the restroom. If you read Bukhari, every one of these is gone out the window. Every one of these things, right? But when did these notions arise? A thousand years, actually, a thousand, two hundred years later. My point is, it's easy for us to look at them, frankly, even in our own trend. Even amongst us, we have to be very clear. Allah sent the Prophet for Sharia, for teaching us Islam, not for teaching us biology, physics, chemistry, architecture, engineering. And the Prophet system is very clear. You know your dunya better than I do. Right? And therefore, we conclude by saying, if you wish to follow the majority position, alhamdulillah, no problem. Good for you. Excellent. And I have no problem with that. But don't pick and choose because that's not fair. Because that's what you end up doing, to be honest. Anybody who does that will not be drinking camel urine. They're only taking a few things and let, leave the rest of them. But if you want to do that, I have no problem. But you see where my sympathies lie. And as I endorse the other position, Dr. Umar Samal Ashkaz and others, we have to be cautious here, first and foremost. We should never, ever make fun of anybody who does those things. Why? Because our Prophet commanded and, and, and did them. We have to be very careful. Don't make a mockery of it. Mocking anything like this potentially is mocking the Messenger وسلم, and that is something no Muslim can ever do. Number two, we have to be very, very explicit that there's nothing wrong with these practices even if it's not necessarily the best practices. For example, Al-Qadi Iyad would say, I'm putting in words into his mouth, okay, let me say this. For that time and place, Camel urine was the best medicine. No problem to say that. But is camel urine the best medicine for liver of the disease now? No. There's nothing wrong 1,400 years ago in Arabia, in that society, for that disease, that was the best they knew. And maybe it was more effective than nothing. Okay. But is it something that is legislative upon us that we must do in our times? No. So there's nothing wrong. We don't criticize. And we also say there's no batil. It was what it was for that time and place. Point number three. We have to be very explicit here as well. There are many groups out there who use portions of what I've said to try to negate the sunnah overall. And we have to say, no, the sunnah is a part of Islam. There is no Islam without sunnah. Obedience to the messenger is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why he was sent. We are not going to go down the route of those groups who munkir hadith and no, not at all. And that's one of the reasons why this is such an awkward topic. Because when you open this door, then the other group becomes happy. We say, no, this isn't for you. Allah sent his Rasul to be followed. But to be followed in what? Matters of Sharia, ah, of Islam, of Salah, of Zakah, of Ilm al Ghaib, of Aqeedah, of Theology. Not in these areas of human things. So we have to be very careful because the other group uses the, these pollen, cross pollination and says, oh, therefore, marriage and divorce, uh, nikah, inheritance, we can all. No, no, no. These are Islam. And we're not going to go to that level. Now, before I conclude, somebody can say, what if somebody, out of pure love, wants to follow what the Prophet ﷺ told us to do? Forget reason. Forget logic. Just love. I want to follow. 
The Prophet said it and did it, I want to do it. We say to this, Al Qadi Iyad, Ibn Khaldun, they have all mentioned this explicitly. Ibn Khaldun says, if somebody follows Tibb al Nabawi from the attitude of tabarruk, from pure iman, then there is no question that that love will bring blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's a separate issue altogether. So the question is not love. The question is, is camel urine going to cure your cancer or your, or your infection? If somebody does it out of love, Allah will reward in al-amal bin niyat. But did this aspect want to be or necessarily be applied? That is what we say. No, it doesn't happen. Ibn Hajar himself said, all that has been narrated from the sunnah with regards to these issues, if somebody does it with sidq, that the Prophet said to do it, then Allah Azza's blessings will come. In other words, there's an element of tabarruk, not necessarily an element of, of uh, medicine over here. And therefore we conclude by saying, look, there have always been these two positions. I quoted you scholars from a thousand years ago and modern scholars as well. And if you wish to follow the majority, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, no problem. Nonetheless, if some people are troubled by genre of hadith that we just don't understand, they don't match up with anything that we know. In fact, sometimes they contradict. So I'll be honest with you, the UN, World Health Organization, and whatnot, they have actually warned against drinking camel urine. They have said it spreads disease, and they have, um, you know, uh, the, with the MERS, you know, that happened, the, the scare that happened, right? That um, uh, MERS, the, the, the virus that, that happened a few years ago, drinking camel urine actually spread this. And so that was one of the reasons it was found in some of these tribes as well, right? Now, obviously, this was very sensitive because some of the scholars thought this is an insult to our Prophet Who is the UN to tell us not to do it when the Prophet did it? And he told, or sorry, when the Prophet told the people to do it, right? So they became a matter of religion. And so it does become very emotional here. How do you reconcile? And the response is, no, the Prophet did not legislatively tell us to do this. It is not a part of our Sharia. Ah. True, we don't make fun of it. True, it's valid for its time and place, but it's not something, this and all of these genres that basically mention medicine, in my humble opinion, it was the best knowledge that they had at the time, and it was fine for them, but it's not something that we need to copy and paste and replicate in our times. And if something is found that really does not and he, you know, make any medical sense and study after study shows, you know, obviously studies have been done in this regard and there is no uh, tangible value in much of this. You understand what I'm talking about. This type is not, you cannot prove it in a blind study by and large, most of this stuff. Therefore, and Allah knows best, we should not have any problems in saying this is from the saying of the Prophet ﷺ. He himself told us about this. When I come to you with the deen, follow it. And when I come to you with the dunya, what did he say? Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. This is what he himself said. Wa akhru da'wan. Alhamdulillah bil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala wa ali wa sahibi jama'in. Inshallah we'll continue next week. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La yazalu al khayru hayyan la yazal. Inna fi dunya salaman wa zilal. Akhbir al ayyam anna fi wisal. Qum bina wa nzur. لآيات الجمال قم بنا وانظر لآيات الجمال